Ladies and gentlemen, we know that today the world is facing existential threat due to human activities. Jean-Marc Jancovici, CO2 expert and member on the High Council on Climate, would tell you that as we replaced human labor with machines, our production capacity exploded, but so did pollution, our CO2 emissions, and global warming. Aurélien Barraud, astrophysicist and philosopher, would tell you that climate change is just one of the many consequences of a much more dramatic trajectory, which he qualifies boldly as the crash of our planet's entire ecosystem. He would add that technology won't save us, and what we need is a complete redefinition of our common set of values to escape our predatory and dominance-driven system. What we need is a philosophical revolution. So, let me ask you this. How does that make you feel? I bet that, like me, most of you find yourselves bouncing between those two reactions. Denial, for one part, or anxiety. As a matter of fact, there is a new term for the latter, echo-anxiety. Echo-anxiety is a paralysis due to fatalism in the face of a seemingly inevitable ecological and social catastrophe. Because it seems, it feels, like there is nothing we can do about it. So, how do we live with these feelings? Or better, how can we turn things around and reinvent ourselves in such climate? Well, today I'd like to illustrate this with my personal story, talking about vulnerability. Um, because what I want to offer you today is this. Faith. Faith against fatalism. So who am I? In the most commonly used terms, I am what you would call an adventurer. You see, adventure is this jump into the unknown for the love of improvisation, discovery, or just movement. It is usually associated to a personal quest for self-accomplishment or just pleasure. That being said, I am also a climate physicist. But let's start from the beginning, shall we? When I was a little boy, my parents used to call me Mr. Y. I'd be asking Y to absolutely everything that would cross my mind or path. I'd ask them, why is the sky blue and why is the sun dazzling? But I, but I guess this was just a manifestation of a great natural curiosity. Anyways, much later, at 18 years old, I discovered the natural wonders of the high Arctic on my own. First in Alaska, where I discovered firsthand that grizzlies are no teddy bears. Surprise. And then in the Yukon Territories in northwestern Canada. Now, we all know that any good story starts with a girl. And mine is no different. Although she was a little different. You see, I met her on some outdoor course, and as we were exchanging pieces of advice, I myself had, ex had become an expert in face-to-face -face bear encounters. She started teaching us how to trap hares, big rabbits, into the wild with a simple copper wire. And I thought, who is that girl? Turns out, her parents were trappers for 30 years. And while I'd be playing flippos in my school's playground here in Etterbeek, they'd venture out into extremely remote mountains along the Arctic Circle, traveling on frozen lakes and rivers with their team of sled dogs, living in total autonomy for eight months at a time in log cabins which they had built themselves by hand. 
I was hooked. Anyway, Mary and I, we became good friends, and a few months later, she offered me to join her in finding her family home, which they had left when she was six years old and nobody had been able to return to ever since. So we went to the local supermarket and bought, bought children's sleds, which we packed with a ton of oat, bacon, and eggs we'd crack into Ziploc, Ziploc bags to let them freeze solid. And then we drove up in the dead of winter along this northernmost highway in America, only to be dropped in the middle of nowhere. Just the two of us, 18 years old each. From there, we walked east, spending 35 days along the in, in the Mackenzie Mountains, sleeping in snow trenches and waking up at 5 a.m. and 30 degrees below to fully lit skies of green, sometimes purple, red, and blue veils hanging from space. The galaxy stretching across, and as we'd start walking, the only noise around being the soft crunch crunch of our steps in the crusted snow. A two-hour-long sunrise would slowly claim its half of the sky, while the other half was still lit with stars and northern lights. That is, ladies and gentlemen, precisely where I fell in love with adventure. It is there and then that my passion for those vast expanse of unspoiled nature got ignited and it's been burning ever since. To find yourself humbled amongst the giant offspring of Mother Nature, mountains, glaciers, lakes, rivers, forests, alone with your thoughts and the sole protection of your instincts, ingenuity and ten fingers, that feeling of empowerment is truly unbeatable. After my little holidays in the Arctic, I started studying physics at university and specialized in climate physics. But then, through a very brief stint into a PhD, I, I realized I'd be sitting in front of a computer for four years and I would never get to experience those places which I'd learned to love so much. So there and then, I quit research, and it, I decided I would have to find my own way into exploration. The following summer, in 2016, I had come to Greenland for the very first time, and I discovered with wonder the infinite possibilities which this vast country had to offer. By then, I had already decided that I would have to come up with an elevated dream to jumpstart my career as a professional adventurer. And this was it. The crazy dream, the crazy idea that shaped into my young foolish mind reached so far beyond my present skills and knowledge that it seemed impossible. But instinctively, I knew that a dream written with a date next to it becomes an objective. That's an objective divided into incremental steps becomes a plan, and that a plan supported by actions becomes a reality. Also, I knew that if your dreams don't scare you, they will never fulfill your full potential. So I got to work. The goal to cross the ice cap of Greenland with skis and a 100 kilo sled for 550 kilometers along the Arctic Circle, then to kayak an extremely remote stretch, 1,000 kilometers along the East Coast, amongst polar bears and sea ice, and then to open up an entirely new route, rock climbing, in one of the major rock faces in the south of Greenland. Rapidly, this impossible dream turned into an ineluctable obsession. And this imperative need 
became the most powerful drive for self-empowerment and growth. Two years later, at a climbing gym here in Brussels, I met my expedition partner, the best one I could have hoped for, Nathan. And together, we proved that two ordinary guys can pull off the extraordinary. Still, to that day, the question remained. How does one reinvent oneself in the face of this global, ecological, and social catastrophe? To Nathan and I, this question translated to the following. What does it mean to be an explorer in 2022 when there are no more lands to discover but a planet to preserve? By the way, to the most observant among you, you might have noticed I've started to use the term explorer instead of adventurer. To me, the way I see it, the difference between the two is this. An explorer goes on adventures on a quest for answers to a specific set of questions. Whether it be in the domain of geography, ethnology, politics or science, the explorer uses adventure as a tool for his investigations. So let's think for a moment about exploration and how it's evolved over time. I believe curiosity is the first ingredient. You see, some people were so curious, they were ready to take risks to see what was around this corner or what was across that ocean. Faith is the second ingredient. Within the same category of people, some believed there was a better world somewhere. Peace, greener pastures, or answers to be found. It got them exploring the world. For a long time though, the scientists themselves were the explorers. If you think about Charles Darwin or Jacques Cousteau. But as technology advanced and we all specialized further and further, the gap between scientists and explorers got wider and wider. And a new subcategory emerged, adventurers of the extremes, conquering world's first and speed records, the highest summits, the deepest abysses, the boldest ascents. Adventure for the sake of adventure. Yet today, a good question to ask is, what do we want? Do we want to keep pushing ever so far the limits of human possibilities? Or isn't there a point where we can say, well, I think we've gone far enough and fast enough and high enough. Now let's redefine who we are and which purpose we could serve. Now, coming back to my partner and I for what we had baptized the Nanok expedition, we felt we had the chance to bridge the gap once more between adventure as a mean to go to remote and inaccessible places and field science. And as we reached out to the scientific community offering our help in the field of environmental or climate science, the degree of enthusiasm in the response was a true source of motivation. It started small but grew bigger. And in total, we collaborated with nine scientists from five institutions across Belgium and Denmark, together, hand in hand, working with the scientists, we elaborated five experiments to be carried out in Greenland during the six months of our expedition. Diving into concrete actions for the preservation of our planet, I found a new purpose. And as we were performing these experiments, and with time, 
I started to realize the impact of our actions. Through my many conversations with the scientists, I'd realized that adventurers were natural ambassadors for easily replicable and effective scientific missions on the field, allowing not only to redefine what's possible or giving hope to the scientists themselves, but to collect data, unique data, at a much lower cost, both financially and most importantly, of course, environmentally speaking. Also, having a scientific background myself, I've always thought scientists are not being given the attention they or the subject of their studies deserve. I'd realize through adventure I had a bigger outreach. I guess frozen toes and blizzards and storms trigger people's curiosity quite effectively. Our expedition allowed us to touch pretty much all levels of society. And through our media collaboration or the filming of our documentary, we had developed many ways to communicate with the general public. I'd realized we gave people a reason to care, the thrill of adventure and the passion in our eyes. But on the other hand, we also gave scientists a voice and a new way to dispense it loud and clear. You see, adventure has always served the purpose of challenging the status quo, helping redefine what's possible and what's not. The challenge ahead today is immense, but we are holding the reins Climate change isn't coming to us. We have been running towards it. Driving a car, closing your eyes while driving a car has never helped you to avoid the obstacles. So I want to say this, look at it. Don't shy away in fear or fatalism. Be explorers of your own selves. Because I heard someone say this one day, the ability to truly feel creates passion. And passion is what leads us to defy the odds. And if nothing else, that is one thing we adventurers are good at. Feeling. Being passionate. So here's my one piece of advice for you tonight. Keep your minds and hearts open. Develop your curiosity, and from whichever line of work you're from, let's strive together for a brighter future, bringing passion into this ecological and social challenge the world is facing today. Because trust me, when you will find out you can do something about it, that denial or anxiety you started with, will turn into action, and fatalism will turn into faith. Thank you very much.